Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, is brought to you by the members of the John Adams. Why not become a member yourself, or even better, a patron, and enjoy all the extras and benefits? Find out more at john-adams.nl, john-adams.nl, and click on Become a Member. From Amsterdam, this is Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, a treasure trove of the best and the brightest of American thinking. And this is an author who wants you to see the truth of this story and his character, but not the whole truth. You know, there's this notion in literature of the unreliable narrator. A narrator that's perfectly reliable is just sheer fantasy. I mean, here's a man who's telling you, and this is what happened to me between 2006 and 2007. Why should he tell you everything? We're fragile storytellers, and it would be too devastating for most of us to be completely honest with ourselves. That's a typically enigmatic turn of phrase from the Nigerian-American writer, photographer, and art historian Teju Cole. His novel, Open City, won the 2012 Penn Hemingway Award and the New York City Book Award. And New York is indeed his main character, Julius's open city. The book's premise is deceptively simple. Julius is a Nigerian psychiatry student who lives in Manhattan. He walks through the town and he has encounters. Most are small. He watches children playing in a park. He discovers the woman next door who he barely knows has died and he is quietly devastated. This story is a study of how tiny moments of observation can have immense impact. Russell Shorto interviewed Teju Cole back in 2012. Shorto was the director of the John Adams at the time. And keeping in the spirit of stories about New York, Russell is also the author of Island at the Center of the World, a history of what New York was like when it was still New Amsterdam. So it should be no surprise that Russell asked Teju to read a passage from Open City that harkens back to its Dutch past and beyond. So here's Teju Cole. Thank, thank you. I just need to get something. I'm going to take my, uh, my camera up here with me in case I see anything interesting. <laughs> if anybody makes um, a memorable facial expression, I'd like to be able to capture it. Thank you all very much for being here. This is really amazing for me. Uh, I've come up a plane this afternoon uh, from New York City, and this is the first time I'm presenting my work in Europe anywhere. This is the first time, uh, though many translations are in progress, this is the first one that's come out. And this is a spectacular location to be in. Uh, what I really want to do is stop talking and just take photos <laughs> until until the sun goes down, but I, I don't think I'll, I'll be allowed to do that. Um, Open City is, an, is a novel that's narrated by Julius, a young Nigerian-German psychiatrist. His mother's German, and he's estranged from her. His father was Nigerian. He died. Uh, Julius grew up in Nigeria and then went to the U.S. And uh, at the time when the book has been, uh, the time that the book covers, Julius is um, finishing a psychiatry residency at Columbia. And the book goes from 2006 to 2007. So this is a book that's very much in the shadow of 9-11. It's basically a, a, a work of mourning about the inchoate and imprecise and difficult feelings of living in the city at that point in time. But it is also a book about how those emotions are experienced by one very particular individual who happens to be well, I hope, an interesting and difficult sort of narrator. In any case, most of the book is set in New York. There's a little section in the middle where he goes to Brussels, and then he comes back to New York. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but Brussels is a kind of double for New York in the book. Most of the book is Julius being by himself or talking one-on-one -on -one with an interlocutor of some sort. You know, what's amazing about history in our lives as we often ignore it, but as it is always there, is that when we look around our built environment, if you look around over the city, a lot of what you're looking at was built by people who are no longer here. And they built it for their own use and for their own purposes. 
Um, and now we live in it as if it's ours and as if they don't matter. And, um, and it's hard for us to have a layered and um, um, a complicated sense of the lives that they led. Like I said, you know, if you, you, you see shops, shop fronts on the first floor in, in New York and you look up and suddenly you're in the 19th century, you know, uh, in a, it's a completely different age. They didn't have penicillin, <laughs> you know, the rights that we take for granted, the world we take for granted. Um, they lived in a completely different world, um, but we live in their built environment. And even in the places where that built environment is gone, we live kind of in the psychic environment that they created. And so I think maybe there are certain people who just feel haunted by history and cannot look over this and think, you know, what I'm, I'm seeing the 17th century, you know, and, and I'm seeing the 18th century. It's kind of a, it's kind of a miraculous thing that this is here around us. Um, but it's also deeply interesting how similar they are to us. If we look closely into um into the lives that they led and the records that are left and we read the newspapers of the time and works of history so um i don't know why it's become such a kind of obsession of mine but um i i i seem to live <laughs> mostly over there so this is uh, just a little uh, section where julius is wandering late at night and earlier on, he sort of gets lost downtown. And out of the corner of his eye, he just sees like a gap between two buildings, like over there. Like, what could that be? And he does not want to think about it. But then later he comes around and he, you know, he sees that it's the, uh, it's the World Trade Center site, which he is because it's, it's, it's late at night and he's wandering around. He's accidentally stumbled on it. This was not the first erasure on the site. Before the towers had gone up, there had been a bustling network of little streets traversing this part of town. Robinson Street, Lawrence Street, College Place. All of them had been obliterated in the 60s to make way for the World Trade Center buildings. And all were forgotten now. Gone, too, was the old Washington Market, the active piers, the fishwives, the Christian Syrian enclave that was established here in the late 1800s. The Syrians, the Lebanese, and other people from the Levant had been pushed across the river to Brooklyn, where they'd set down roots on Atlantic Avenue and in Brooklyn Heights. And before that, what Lenape paths lay buried beneath the rubble? The site was a palimpsest, as was all the city, written, erased, rewritten. There had been communities here before Columbus ever set sail before Verrazano anchored his ships in the Narrows, or the black Portuguese slave trader Esteban Gomez sailed up the Hudson. Human beings had lived here, built homes, quarreled with their neighbors, long before the Dutch ever saw a business opportunity in the rich furs and timber of the island and its calm bay. Generations rushed through the eye of the needle, and I, one of the still legible crowd, entered the subway. I wanted to find the line that connected me to my own part in these stories. Um, Sorry, I forgot I mentioned the Dutch in that. Well, well I, I set you up for that. <laughs> yeah, you did. Um, uh, okay, so uh, the New York focus is clear and the reason for that is clear. You mentioned uh, earlier uh, that you had a re reasons for choosing Brussels as the sort of uh, second city that you were focusing on. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, so in the middle of the book, Julius takes vacation from his psychiatric practice and he goes to Brussels for a month. And while he's in Brussels, he um, has encounters with people there, mostly conversations. Um, he says he was thinking of, well, either going diving in Cozumel in Mexico or... Um, going to Brussels in December, where for sure it will be raining and depressive. And because he's a character in a book I'm writing, <laughs> helplessly he chose Brussels. Um, his, his ostensible reason for going to Brussels was to um, find his grandmother, his German grandmother, 
who had moved from Germany and come to live in the city. When he gets here, he makes some not particularly strong efforts to find her. He takes a room somewhere and he basically just sort of stays in mostly, wanders around the city, talks to strangers sometimes, um, somewhat depressed. Um, why did I choose Brussels? Because I wanted a double for New York in the book. I did not want it. I wanted some kind of international focus for the book, but I didn't want um, an obvious double. Um, I lived for quite a while in London and and I visited, I guess, several of the European capitals, but Brussels just kind of made sense to me as uh, the crossroads of much of what is darkest in European history. Um, every time, uh, shout out to the Belgians in the crowd. <laughs> um, you know, every time France and Germany and Holland and England have a little argument, they say, I'll meet you over in Belgium. <clears throat> and they have a little war over there and a few thousand people die. And this has been going on for hundreds of years. Um, so there was the the idea of that part of the of the world being sort of haunted, and at the same time, you know, it is kind of the de facto capital of the new European Empire now. You know, uh, even if we look at it neutrally as a bureaucrat city, it is a place where that power is concentrated, and at the same time, like very many European cities, it's a place that's struggling to make sense of immigration and what does it mean to be just to the other. And added to all that, you know, King Leopold's ghost and uh, the horrible legacy of the colonial presence in the Congo. So there was this range of issues that just seemed to overlap with um, the things I wanted to write about loss, about memory, about mourning, and about the unfinished past um, that were completely different issues from New York. Um, but that kept resonating with it in uh, interesting ways. And the main encounter that uh, Julius has in Brussels is with a young man called Farouk, um, who is actually quite similar to him in many ways, but also different. And the way I structured it in my mind was that Julius is, is New York and Farouk is Brussels, and, uh, and they're not, and then they have an argument. Not an argument, they have a discussion um, and 70%, 80% of the time they're actually in agreement with each other, but the points of disagreement interest me. Um, and that I found more interesting than having like, you know, a guy representing the left and a guy representing the right, because that's boring. You can watch that on television. Um, here are two young men who would consider them, they're both from Africa and would both consider themselves quite liberal. Um, neither is particularly religious, but they're both sort of agnostic. Um, they're both well-versed in literature and in theory. Um, and yet they have uh, important disagreements. Um, and they have different... Um, the wounds of history have affected them differently. So I thought that would be interesting to explore. Um, so uh, you have talked about, and reviewers have talked about, um, uh, how uh, your, your your book seems more like a book of, say, a century ago. The, the, the sort of modernist writers, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, um, D.H. Lawrence, maybe. Uh, in uh, Is that fair to say, and is that something you, you hearken to the, that generation of writers, for, and, and if so... For what purpose? What 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 isn't there in the air now that there was then? I mean, I'll I'll readily admit that my book is old fashioned in that sense. Um, but the argument I would like to make is that most books are even more old fashioned because they are they are written on mid nineteenth century models. Um, I think I feel as if most model uh, most novels these days are written in an sort of uh, in the style of Dickens or in the style of Jane Austen. Um, <clears throat> a coherent uh, sort of third person uh, narrative with uh, lively characters and everything that ties up neatly at the end and uh, we're off to the 
chapel to go get married. Um, and I just find that terribly boring. So I decided to make a great leap forward into 1920. <laughs> Um, so I guess what I mean is that I don't think uh, what I'm doing here is particularly innovative. Um, I just, particularly for American readers, um, who I feel have a somewhat safe mode of reading, uh, of expectations of what a novel should do. Um, I feel as if most novels being published these days are written as if European high modernism never happened. Um, and with high modernism, you get an exploration of consciousness. You know, somebody, I don't know who it was, who said a novel is like a, taking a mirror for a walk down a busy road. And so there's this sense of the ongoingness of life and of the drift and activity of life. And to find the prose and to find the writing that can make that live and make that coherent. Um, and Joyce did it extremely successfully, and Virginia Woolf did it very successfully. Uh, Musil did it, and Mann did it, and Brock did it. Um, and uh, we seem to have sort of abandoned it. It's like, um, and I think we we live in maybe in a similar, similarly transitional time. I'm just, and I do like the old-fashioned storytelling, um, but I prefer it if it's done as an HBO series. Uh, you know, it works wonderfully on television, like The Wire, you know, that's great. Um, but in a book, you know, it's like I've seen it before. And I just, I want a book to do what no other medium can do. And television can't take us really deep inside someone's thoughts. Um, but a book can really do that. You know, you can open up a book at 3 a.m. And suddenly you, you're in a different country, in a different era. Um so uh, I feel very flattered by the comparison, and I admit it. Yeah. Um, uh, not only that, but you um, overtly make uh, references. And uh, the one, I'm going to ask you to read one more paragraph, if you don't mind. And it's the last paragraph of the section in Brussels in which, um, I don't, well, I'll just say that it, I, I think, I don't know, consciously sentence by sentence, it riffs on, the last paragraph of James Joyce's story, The Dead. And it's beautiful. It's it's So it's referencing something else, and yet it's unique to itself and wraps up this whole Brussels section. So maybe, would you mind reading that? Night had fallen. I entered the apartment and threw off my clothes and lay in bed in the darkened room naked. Heavy drops tapped on the window. The weather report was right. In ever-widening circles from where I stood, rain was lashing the land. It fell heavily all over the Portuguese district, on the shrine to Pessoa and on Casa Botelho. It fell on Khalil's phone shop, where Farouk had perhaps just begun his shift. It fell on the bronze head of Leopold II at his monument, on Claudel at his, on the flagstones of the Palais Royal. The rain kept coming down on the battlefield of Waterloo on the outskirts of the city, the Lion's Mound, the Ardennes, the implacable valleys full of young men's bones grown old, on the preserved cities farther out west, on Ypres and the huddled white crosses dotting Flanders fields, the turbulent channel, the impossibly cold sea to the north, on Denmark, France, and Germany. So uh, that is, it's a very uh, pointed uh, parallel with that uh, piece of writing from that period. Can you say anything about what, I mean, you're, when you're doing something that pointed, you're making a statement beyond, I mean, you're, you're using those references for one thing, as you talked about a minute ago, using that sort of construction, method of constructing a novel. But here you're sort of, saying this in particular. So wh why are you saying that? Yes, yeah, so uh, as Russell notes, I'm not, I'm not too shy of, of my influences. I, my, I guess my main idea is to have as many of them as possible, not to just be stuck with one. Um, so I had, like to have lots of influences. But that particular passage, which 
basically transposes the marvelous uh, passage that ends uh, the short story, The Dead by James Joyce, and which will be recognizable to many readers. I wrote this book, well, not as a writer, but as a reader. And I wanted it to reflect the experience of reading because I assume that my readers are also readers. This is not the first book they're reading. And so there's a family resemblance between the author and his readers in that here's something we've all read before and here's a reminder of it. Because one of my favorite experiences in reading any book is to see a moment of formal daring to say, while in the middle of a book, which I thought I knew exactly all what she was doing, all what he was doing, to suddenly come across something and say, I can't believe she had the fucking nerve to do that. You know, it's like just suddenly some other thing that interrupts the texture in a way. And so I have that sort of in different ways in this book. There's something that almost seems as if he's channeling Joyce. There's other places where momentarily we fall out of strict realism and it's like he's he's hallucinating and just different things like that. I just wanted to be free to write this book because I had nothing to lose, you know? I mean, who knew whether it would be my only chance to make a little bit of trouble? So, uh, you know, like they'll never let me write another one after this. I'm going to, you know, be as badly behaved as possible. Um, the I don't want to give anything away, but there's a final revelation, or nearly final revelation in the book. I can't believe you just gave that away. <laughs> and um, and uh, that, to my mind, changes uh, the way you've been thinking about the narrator uh, and the whole reliability of it, which is also a device from that, from back then. I thought of the novel The Good Soldier, the Ford Maddox Ford novel. Um, is that part of your, is that what you, you see in it? Yeah, except in this case, that's actually not from modernism at all, but just from my experience of uh, reality, which is that, you know, there's this notion in literature of the, of the unreliable narrator. And I guess my sense is that a narrator that's perfectly reliable is just sheer fantasy. I mean, nobody is perfectly reliable. So I wanted to bridge that gap between the unreliable narrator and the way we actually do tell stories to ourselves the way we tell stories about ourselves. Here's a man who's telling you, and this is what happened to me between 2006 and 2007. Why should he tell you everything? We're fragile storytellers, and it would be too devastating for most of us to be completely honest with ourselves. Um, particularly if you're a psychiatrist, and you don't want to go yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, you know. that's a layer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so this thing happens, and he he's the narrator, so he's telling us about this thing that, yeah. uh, giving us this information. And he's been talking to us the whole time, and he says nothing about that, which I find, I mean, since I have you right here, I want to ask you, what's the deal with that? Why doesn't he comment on this thing? And don't give it away what the thing is. Um, I wish I knew whose idea this was, but <laughs> somebody, no, no, this, this next thing, which is that, they, they ask somebody, so, you know, that, that novel, what did you really mean by it? And he, he said, and so when I, began, you know, and just started to read from page one. In other words, um, the meaning of the novel is contained within, within it. I mean, I don't want to be, I don't want to be excessively coy, but I mean, I think the, the silences and the gaps are, uh, and not an accidental part of the of the texture or 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 the structure, and even you know, and, and even parts that leave you a little bit, you know, frustrated. Parts are a little bit open headed. They're not. Um, to a certain extent, those things might actually just be the the, the pretext by which we're we're drawn along to participate inside his. In, in his head because that's that's really what that's really what the central point of it is you know if you watch a film by M michael haneke he's not going to tie all the loose ends up for you uh and you're going to you know leave the theater somewhat exhilarated and you also want to sort of go out and kick a dog or something you know <laughs> because you just don't know what to do with yourself yeah. 
Um, and I, a little bit of that. Just yeah, yeah. So, um, and I, and I, 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 I don't know, you know, how, how successful it is, but that's certainly part of the intention to, to leave something in abeyance, to leave something in suspension, something unresolved. And there are probably better ways of doing it and worse ways of doing it. But that was uh, the effort being made here to not tie it up. Thank you again. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Teju Cole reading from and talking about his novel, Open City. The evening was presented by Russell Shorto. Teju Cole has a new book coming out in 2023. It's called Tremor, and it's described as one man's creative, personal, and professional life in the lead up to the pandemic. You know that you can go to our website, john-adams.nl slash videos, where you will find a link to this event and lots of other events. We also have a newsletter you can sign up for and a veritable treasure trove of great American thinkers, speakers, and writers at john-adams.nl. And while you're there, why not become a member of the John Adams? Not only do you support what we do, you get a discount to future live events. In the meantime... Go to wherever you go to get your podcasts and review this show. It'll help get the word out, and we can keep on sharing the very best of American thinkers with you, free of charge. That's it for this week's show. Our theme song is called La Prensa by the Parlandos. Our editor is Tracy Metz. From Amsterdam, this was Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute. I'm Jonathan Gruber. Thank you for listening. Thank you.